I think we're live. Okay. Okay, hello everyone. Thanks for, uh, is this on? Okay. Hello everyone. Thanks for tuning in. The title of tonight's episode is an interesting one. It is titled The Lantern in the Sky Behind Our Eyes. So what I mean by this is that there is a light in the sky that provides the presence and the positioning of our world. It's not that human beings should start worshipping the sun. It's that without light, there would be no enlightenment. There would be nothing to attempt to get enlightened. There would be no effort for a true clarity if there's nothing to see. So the first great grand blessing of the cosmic sector to the human intelligence was the ability to be present in a world. (coughs) As we are present in a world, we are questioning the structure of reality. You see, I find the fact that we can even doubt is an evolutionary advancement. There was a moment in man's mind where we were only followers. We could not lead beyond an awareness of the current program. So I want you to see that the human being enters this world and in some sense starts consuming to stay alive. You need to consume food to stay alive. What that means is a part of your intelligence needs to take from the world in order to stay with it. So what that means is that we're in a give and take relationship with this world of ours and there are certain moments where we require to uh, in some sense our decisions be oriented to our inner clarity and sometimes to our outer clarity when you are in some sense being lied to externally inner clarity is important when you're lying to yourself internally which can happen then in some sense externality becomes the clarity I want to speak about how would I say it like just a second guys hold on If I asked you, if you could conceptualize or try to visualize to some degree how writers back in the day at night would turn on a lantern and they would in some sense, uh, that lantern would be a permission for them to use the space. So in some sense, we can say the light in the room is the permission of the world. And so there is a light in this world. In this light, we tend to try to conceptualize it existentially and we fall short because the depth of our experience is multidimensional. Kind of like whenever you want to exist, it's a singular dimension. Whenever you want to experience, it has to be multidimensional because experience kind of commands innately within it dynamism. This dynamism is a command of the universal sector. So what that means is that as the human being starts studying how they are being a human being, they will eventually realize the world they're in and they'll eventually see the path 
patterns and relationships that have been developed with the world kind of subconscious contracts you have made with manifest reality. These sub subconscious contracts have to do with various moments. And so this is the complexity of the human mind that the child could have an experience in its youth and that experience could con contain, literally pull that child's attention away from externality. That is the power of a belief. And I cannot say beliefs are good and bad because I cannot say the leaves of a tree are good and bad. As the seasons change, so do the nature and the texture of the ideology that one is fixated upon. Uh, there has been no day where I could have held on to a thought. <clears throat> I have attempted. I have tried to, in some sense, carry thoughts into my unconscious. It's denied. And I can tell you why it's denied. It is denied because the unconscious doesn't need the help of the conscious. What that means is only the conscious requires exploration into the unconscious. Kind of what that means is um, man wants to be God. God doesn't want to be man. And when I use the word God, I am speaking about an archetype for the ultimate. What else can it be? <coughs> we human beings, we measure the world. After we have measured it, the values of the measurements become part of our lives. It's as if when I realized there was something called gravity, there was a complete authorization of my inner structure to accept the concept. You see, you have to see what relates to you and then you have to see how you relate to everything else. And that's the uh, kind of journey of the complete mind. <clears throat> I remember I was... Um, I think externally I have come across foolish to many human beings. But internally I have kind of realized that there are intensities of value. And I think that is the gift I bring. Kind of like an acknowledgement of what is here and how what is here is being how we think there is somewhere else. So in some sense we have to, we have to complete the games of the human being to in some sense find the evolution beyond those games. <clears throat> and society has to be entertained but something society is like you got to give it its bone <laughs> many times i have asked myself what is the greatest result of attention? There was a time where I thought it was being a sort of physical position. And then I thought, no, it's, it's having a sort of unique subjective awareness. And then I realized the stories keep on going and the mind generates every moment a new structure upon the world and these structures come and go and so do we. And when we realize the inevitability and how temporary the life is, we will forget about the values we impose on others and we impose upon the world. You just realize we're all travelers in the void of space and time and uh, how can we manage this? this time that we are in this space and so there requires an intention and I call this a co sort of cosmic command <clears throat>
Anyways, to continue. <clears throat> we are all alive in a world that changes. Uh, our free will is the permission to change with it and to change things. You see, it's uh, eventually I find all of civilization will realize the value of the artistic vision. The value of the artistic vision is that the man can rather having a relationship with the unknown where the unknown overwhelms his meaning. In some sense, his meaning actually amplifies from the unknown. Anytime you see you don't know something, there's a potential to know. Anytime you see there's no meaning in your life, there's a potential for new meaning to arise. And that is the truth of it all. That we are all dancing in dreams that we need to wake up from. I find that um, language is a bridge. And a bridge has as much value as the user of the bridge. So if you say language is a bridge between people's inner realities, then this bridge must be used. And so what is found when you travel to a new land? You have to reemerge into a new self. No man can step in into the portal and still be the same man. No man can live a moment of life and think as if nothing happened. This world of ours is filled with meaning. Our experiences are sculpting the ability of the free will. Fundamentally, what you are is an energetic vision, kind of like if the energetic vision was speed, you added direction to it, it becomes velocity. So Mr. Within wants to say pretty much human beings, your, your state of living in this planet is a sort of velocity that means you need to have a sort of objective direction and as you make attempts towards that direction the world opens up in various meanings for me it's just all about opportunity to be honest there isn't much to talk about in this world <clears throat> when it's this big what's worth talking about is what we have access to so so mr within finds what is reality is not just what's here but it's what can be here and that can be is the evolutionary gift that is the advantage of our eyes as the homo sapien we saw the future ahead of the other species and we adjusted to it they say the main difference between human beings and animals is that animals are not aware of their death they're not aware that they will die. They don't have a sense of time like, oh my God, I'm going to die if I don't do anything. Like they don't have that self-generated fear. That is the luxury of the superior species, of a superior species where they can see their suffering. You know how many animals, even if they suffer, the animal is not aware it's suffering. It just, it's just an energetic program of behavior. Kind of like how certain scholars have said that the animal has a free will and we can't know if it has a soul or not but like it has a free will but its free will of its soul is limited to its body that means man was the permission the greater permission of the free will to now apply to the world not just be limited to the motion of the body we are all evolving and eventually in this evolution we will ask what is evolving and the mind has really two ways it looks at it it looks at it either individually or collectively what that means is, to be honest, it's hilarious. All of spiritual uh, thought is divided between where the attention concludes the origin of the world to be. If the attention concludes the origin of the world is in the known, then it's as if life becomes all about knowing things. If it becomes about the unknown, it becomes all about re realizing why the knowledge is here. It's like there's a deeper dimension to that. <clears throat> The lantern in the sky behind your eyes is a suggestion to how the light of the sun has, has, has emerged as an origin point of intelligence for your being. 
You see, for me, I kind of, there have been many moments I have lived in a kind of version of the world I'm seeing. And eventually throughout the day, that version of the world cracks. And I find these crevices to a totally different meaning, as if you can never be sure of anything when there's many angles, you could look at the same thing. And if there are many angles, you could look at the same thing. Is the same thing really there? Or is it the mind's game that infinitely it projects, projects, projects until it realizes why the projector is on? And that is the mystical quest. To realize the source of the attention and the source of the attention will lead towards the non-local and the attributeless and when the source of the attention leads to the attributeless you reach a sort of kind of your it's like you're get you're stretching you're you're warming up your hands as a mystical pianist and in some sense you're getting ready to play the melody of your lifetime and the melody of your lifetime has to do with you realizing where the value of the experience of life is and i want you to just consider that if you lived for yourself let's say right now you achieved all your dreams and you will eventually see the next grand dream after you have given heaven to yourself you will wonder if the world needs heaven and that is when the soul emerges forth. That is when you become the roar of the cosmos after eons of sleep. You know, sometimes I've been known to stay, stay up late at night and people ask me, why don't you sleep? And I tell them because I was asleep my whole life. To me, life is a solo journey. You are a pilot of your mind <clears throat> in manifestation or as manifestation. And there's so many ways that we can zoom into phenomena to bring forth uh, design about it. You know, on some level, I honor every person in the educational industry, like any person who has cared to share education with their species. But at the same time, when I look at the modern educational system, it's as if I am, I feel like kind of, you know, a distant relative of Sun Tzu asking Sun Tzu if he's ready to go to war for, with me. What that means is that I, re, I have realized this, this notion of ideological possession. It's as if we forget to be human beings when we are trying to be ideas that were never intended for humans that is the issue of the technological realm in some sense reality is being translated into a meaningless quality of an illusion when we give our when we when you feed the desires and there's this kind of incredible story this native american story of the the two wolves that are within the person and there is a good wolf you know and a, and a bad wolf kind of like metaphors for the yin yang symbol and the good and the bad are intentional literally how much you have allowed chaos to occur in your life and how much you have allowed order to occur and in some sense this story of these two wolves fighting once there in some sense when the story was told someone asked wow who, which wolf wins which wolf wins does the good win or does the bad i must know which wolf wins and in that instant there comes the grand answer the one you feed your free will designs your destiny and your free will is your attention. And your attention, like, like imagine you were a Venetian swordsman back in the day, it has the same sort of discipline. That reality must be preserved in the eyes of man, but it must be preserved in the eyes of humanity first. And so this is how you check if life is worth living. First, you ask, what would you do if you were in that situation? The second thing you ask, what would my world do if they saw me in this situation? And then comes the roars, uh, <laughs> the roars of the evolutionary mind. That's when the lantern behind your eyes becomes the motivation that you realize light exists so you exist. It's like somebody asked, why are you shining? And he's like, because there's these creatures on a rock in the distance that need something to see. The permission of sight is divinity. It is the miracle. The, 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 it's like, what if the proof of your divinity is instantaneous? And because it is so instantaneous, you cannot embed it into a linguistic structure of meaning. <coughs> Sorry guys, I need like a two minute intermission. So just hang in there.
Okay, sorry about that, guys. Just had to do something. <coughs> okay. What I'm simply trying to say is that due to our evasion of ancient values, we have created a sort of modernity that has accepted the world through multidimensional ways and at the same time and has denied the uh, abstract. What that means is imagine your imagination and your vision of reality were like your children. And these two children came to tell you something that had happened. It's as if you're listening to reality first, then imagination. There is a sort of hierarchical value. Personally, in myself, I used to be defined by ideology, and then I broke those chains and freed myself from my ideal, ideological owners. What that means is I was a slave to my environment for a long time. And because I was a slave to my environment, there was this kind of boiling. It's like behind my eyes, there was an urge for the real life to happen sooner and sooner and sooner until eventually time, something in your attention moves faster than time. It is the revelation of the instantaneity of cause and effect being noticed in one moment. The fact that life is happening in a moment is the remarkability. It is what is really remarkable about how we are able as creatures that our eyes open and close and yet we still are here. For me, it's kind of like, all right, I'm just a creature in my waking state of consciousness. The world opens up to me. As I see the world, so does the world see me. And in some sense, there is a relationship of the mind of man with the unknown mind of the uh, universe. <clears throat> What I would like to see, a kind of one of those commands from the heart of the cosmos, of the heart of hearts. Human beings have to attempt their greatest opportunity. That is it. Life is not asking you to be a good person. Life is not asking you to be a bad person. Life is asking you that in any moment you are alive, there is an opportunity for the greatest self to be attempted to for. You know, I understand there are people like Salvador Dali, and of course he was a remarkable mind. Salvador Dali says, do not fear perfection. You will never reach it. An artist who drew some certain next level surreal perfect drawings. And so in some sense, that is the truth of it. The spectrum increases. You cannot enter the unknown with an ego because the curiosity of the cat can kill you. What that means is imagine the first people who saw lava. One of them touched it and regretted it. You know, someone, someone, one person's running away from the lava, some people are running towards it. And that is the story of civilization, the madness and the order that made the stories of our life function. As if there are certain, um, what I'm trying to say is like you walk on the street and you're like, these are some modern streets of 2019 and yet you realize on these streets there are people walking with ancient programs in their mind ancient value systems that have carried on genetical uh, attitudes that lie dormant in their DNA in some sense because what is your DNA it is a justifier of how you see things and because of, based on how you see things your personality emerges so Mr. Within is simply saying forget this game about uh, trying to escape the world into somewhere better. To be honest, that's the wrong kind of directions. It's as if you ask, how do you get to the mall and somebody pointed to the desert? It's as if it's... <laughs> Bruce Lee has this quote where he says, be like water. And that's an incredible sentence because you're like, what do you mean be like water, bro? <laughs> <laughs> and Bruce Lee says, water can be strong and crash. Imagine the fall of a waterfall. And water can also be gentle 
So Bruce Lee, and by just saying be like water, he's saying let your mind have a flexibility to appreciate what is really here in the world. And what is really in here is not a known process. This is why intellect dis- detaches you from the social realm. Because intellect has to acknowledge that it is a superior position. We have to feel like we can be gods to even consider gods. You see, any idea, all ideology in, in our modern time is orbiting around a central point. And that central point is the emergence of a collective potential. It's as if all the animals on this planet, if they could talk, aside from the human species, if they could talk and they were looking at the human species, they would say, Jesus Christ, guys, what's taking you so long? Unite and liberate your universal sector. What greater game is there to play? Eventually, the archetypes of man as technology evolves will become galactic. What that means is we're going to wonder about the emergence of the personality uh, in spaces beyond the known universe. You know, and in some sense, science has to realize, has to at least appreciate the religious mindset for its depth. You see, it's, it's, it's as if the philosopher is a very interesting position. The philosopher says, holy shit, the unknown is too much than I can know. So you have to be a philosopher. There's no other way. You're kind of like that, you know, a pacifist agnostic with, it, with their own philosophy. <laughs> The emergence of greatness, the realization that the great is allowed, it is allowed. Freedom is a permission, it's an inner authorization. And because most children's psychology is dependent on a kind of authority-oriented system, uh, just like how the child needs to trust the parents and the parents need to trust the child, it becomes one of those situations where life is a... It's just many forms of intelligence functioning together. And this functioning from a designer's viewpoint either has beautiful geometrical efficiency or it is inefficient. That's it. Your life is as valuable as the future generations can, their eyes can be opened. So the ratio of freedom for the future has to do with actions now. And so Mr. Within is saying that I have never seen a greater theatrical performance than the leaders of nations talking in one room. Because it's as if we are united nations, yet we are nations. How can we be united? There is separation. And so we have to re, re every child on this earth has to wonder uh, what separation truly means and what is the value. Mr. Within, I, I personally have this feeling that the, the future of our species, our civilization, when I say civilization, that's a heavy word. That means every eight billion people and their activities. It means every human being and what they're doing. That is the true civilization. At its core, it is unimaginable. But at its, uh, from the surface, we see what it is. It's as if we cannot touch the hold the lantern in the sky, yet we see the light that enters our eyes. And so it's up to the poets. So here's the thing. Pretty much what's going to happen is technology is going to capture people's imagination and we're going to become human beings that have been pushed to the corner of a technological reality. And what does that mean? That means we will, uh, di- our, there will be for the first time, okay, think about it. You're a natural being. Um, there is a thought of you that moves you, let's say. You're, there's a sort of egoic construct, a sort of self in the void that you are. And this self in the void, realistically, it can have two options, either remain natural or become unnatural. This is why there is there's never a concept of balance is a flaw, because it's, it's kind of like the good and the bad. How can you have balance without imbalance? How can you have imbalance without balance? How can you be good if there's no identification of what is evil? How can you be evil when there's no identification of what is good? And so the stories that run wild in the eyes of our species is what is deciding how the species will emerge next. 
it's a constant process of transformation. When I say transformation, that means you are a form and if you do, based on the nat natural consequences of your environment, based on nature, you're moving and you're changing. And there is the stance of the free will. We have to open our eyes by realizing they are open. There is no other way. It's as if I ask myself, let's say I found the greatest secret. It would still be a moment's reception. It will be a momentary awareness to phenomena and then there will be many other moments. <clears throat> and so we are. We are truly at our core an attributeless roaming attention like a wind that has direction but is not limited to form. You know what's the most hardest opponent to kill? When I say opponent to kill, I'm saying in, in, in the sense of war. Sometimes when I speak, the context, the images I have of things, they move through different phases of history. Like sometimes when I say a sentence, I'm thinking of, for example, like uh, ancient Greek wars, you know? It used to be survival of the fittest. Mr. Within will now say it is survival of the sharpest attention. mystery as a gift and I find that when the human being gets tired of uh, uh, the self-obsession that we're conditioned into after the phase of self-obsession what that means is anybody who wants to go somewhere better you're obsessed with yourself <laughs> all those people who want to go to heaven I will clap for you in a strange way because you are obsessed with yourself you have proven to the world that you, your attention can truly stand in one position. But what if, what if our body horizontally could move in certain dimensions, but our mind could move infinitely? What if the mind is the extension of the body's movement? And what if the body's movement it will always be considered by the mind? That means it's a very intense idea. Imagine a person is in one world, goes through a portal, goes into another world. When that person is in that other world, when we think of his psychology, it's as if he is somewhere, but he is not where he used to be. What that means is the concept has traveled into a different context of the world's meaning. And so this is what Mr. Within is saying. This, I think, can really help the educational system. If the educational system realizes simply that children are, their intelligence is a momentary thing. That means you, this is why there was sort of things as ceremonials and rituals back in the day. Because those rituals were a certain unique sequencing of activities that in a placebo way shifted how the mind authorized phenomena to itself. So right now I can look at, for example, this uh, pen in front of my, in front on my computer and I, could, I see this pen and my mind can suddenly Im close my eyes and I can imagine that pen just being atoms. I could see the molecular structure and, you know, the halls of lattice that there are uh, for this object. But then I could see my mind can also just see it purely as a color, as if that is not a pen, pen that is just the color blue, as if, on, as if reality is a screen of color only. You see, there's many ways the attention can settle in. It's kind of like a flying in and out kind of situation. Your mind is like an eagle. Okay, and to be honest, the true concept of ego vision is in a concept which um, certain video games have attempted to share it properly. <laughs> but what it means is that pretty much the eagle had a vision, had an ability to look at all the forests in the sky or fly onto a single branch. And that is the space of freedom that the ego sh is, it's healthy for the ego to be. That fear and desire do not uh, uh, 
uh, interfere with how you're navigating your attention as a free being. You see, it's as if freedom is not just freedom for others. It is freedom for self. I've, I've totally, I've personally experienced this, but I'm sure many people have, where they have been living in an illusion of freedom because they have just been living for others and not themselves. Because it is a struggle of finding where the attention should go and how value should emerge. The lantern in the sky ends up being the greatest vision that light allows. Fundamentally, we are, our subjective realities are dependent on the light spectrum. One can say that thought can be seen to have as much value as the thought can be seen. That means if you don't see a design, uh, you cannot recognize that pattern. For example, when you learn the contents of uh, one language, the words of one language, when you hear those words, they suddenly evoke an uh, image in your mind. So a sort of sound becomes connected to a sort of image. It becomes a marriage of thought and matter where language, that's what language is in, is in some sense. And so an object becomes no longer just an object, it becomes a pen. And then a pen has meanings on its own. So you eventually see the whole system of language is orchestrated in, a, in accordance to a sort of branching out integrative approach. And in this life, regardless of how the picture of life is painted, there is the ability of that ego vision where you look at things from a collective macrocosmic perspective or you look at things from an individual micro kind of perspective you know it's like as Plato said as above so below but that, that 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 still means there is an above and there is a below you see it's as if like if I tell you tell me where is up we will see a giant ball in the middle of an empty space can't really have a direction it's like what is up what is down so we find the hollowness of language and being able to properly relay an experiential phenomena and the limits of language. I, I personally have created the term the language threshold. That means that's a concept that is real to me in the way that we have certain experiences as human beings that we cannot put them into language. And if our evidence requires language, then we're limited to the language. What that means is it's like, uh, the person um, uh, uh, um, is looking for a certain thing and because they're looking for a certain thing, everything else that comes to them, uh, they don't acknowledge because they are looking for a certain way they want the world to exist. But to be honest, if I asked you, with a universe with a billion trillion stars, do you, how much do you think this universe cares? And what I mean by that is that there is a vastness here that commands individual responsibility. It's like whether you like it or not, you have to live this life. And that's the cool part, that there is something to do in emptiness. The fact sometimes I sit, I remember I've had times where I've kind of sat in the park on a bench and I'm like, whoa, I could have totally not existed right now, but why do I exist? And it's kind of like the purpose of existence is in the existence. It's kind of like the guy's like, I need proof for my life. And the, the person's like, yo man, the proof, of the proof is right here. Who's asking the question? And that's when you find the seer, the seer within, the seer of thought, the presence of the being beyond, the ideological clothing it wears to be a, a social animal. It's kind of like how the sm some of the most intelligent kind of people in history have said. The smartest among you is the one who sees a world to live for. That's it. You have to live to have life simply change. That means that's the kind of luxury of life, to consciously live. As if I want you to imagine, when you even look at many other animals, you see 
many other species, you see there's an unconscious intelligence to them. Like that ant is not wondering where it is, but it's following certain design of its intelligence. So the design of intelligence starts off being an unconscious design. Literally things are happening on their own. And then there emerges through evolutionary moments a sort of awareness to the mover. So the fact that we are aware of movement is like we are having the stillness of another dimension. It took me a long time to realize that intelligence is defined by uh, all that it sees rather than what it thinks it sees. The issue with the intellect, especially in social environments, is that the intellect gives the person a position of hierarchy and makes themselves believe that position in their own hierarchy. So what that means is pretty much when you think you're special or you think you have something yay extra you know what happens is the psychology assumes a thought in every moment the same thought in every moment and eventually you will see holes through the thought so to be honest if i it's kind of like every moment before i sleep i just look at every thought i've had that day and i'm like okay this was the journey of the day There's a story of Diogenes. Diogenes was, he was this Greek philosopher. And uh, pretty much what happens is one day this guy is holding a lantern and running in the market. And Diogenes, this philosopher, suddenly someone comes up to him. He's like, Diogenes, what are you doing, man? You have a lantern lit in the day. You're wasting a candle, bro. And so Diogenes is like, pretty much the guy's like, Diogenes, what are you doing? And Diogenes shouts at this man. He says, I am looking for an honest man. It's as if he realized the illusion of the world is not just external, it is internal as well. The way people are being people is is either with an awareness that there is others or with an awareness there is not. The problem with being selfish is that you end up being on an island alone. That's the issue with selfishness. When you take too much from your world rather than giving, in some sense what happens is you find yourself uh, going astray from the value of human of the human being because you see the thing is our strength is in our numbers because our numbers are not just numbers every 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 person is a mind it's like some all the kids that are being born probably some of them are going to be the next inventors and geniuses of the future so in some sense what kind of uh, 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 values are we in some sense uh, teaching our children's children's children to carry what, what beacons are we passing down to the generations ahead and I think the greatest achievement that we could do is just attempt to make the internal external and understand the relationship of the external with the internal What that means is if you are an explorer, you have no limitations. The concept is meaningless to you. The world is meant to be observed. And it is, I will tell you, the more more you abide with your true nature, which requires a sort of emergence of the sincere, honest, and authentic uh, winds of kind of life. And when that happens, 
But what really, I think, occurs is that when you wake up from a dream, your mind is in a new way of seeing the same thing. Kind of like how the Sufi dervishes ancient times, like thousand years ago in Neshapur, they would say stuff like, uh, you know, you got to die before you die. And the person's like, whoa, what do you mean? What do you mean I got to die before I die? And the person's like, the idea of you has to be seen not to be the real you. It's as if how dare you put a thought as a mask on your face and look in the mirror and have emotions about that being you. You know, it's like life is more uh, more supreme than uh, the, the co inferiority complex, which is pretty much evolutionary fear. What that means is when a creature feels weak, it stops fighting. And when a creature feels strong, it starts fighting. It's all leading to a global network. A community of human beings that will bring forth a multidimensional reform. Society and civilization will be redesigned. It will be redesigned in a way where rather than peep 8 billion unique people with unique intelligences uh, all adjusting to one sort of system of uh, valid educated education, they eventually begin to see no, we are all harboring gifts from the unknown and you have to live life to kind of be in it it's kind of a fancy way imagine you were uh, a, a kind of eternal being and you got bored and you're like all right let's play this human game and so you open your eyes and you see that in because of this awareness that there is something more the fear of what is here leaves you You become aware of subjective phenomena, objective phenomena from the same point, and that's when Satchit Ananda occurs. And if you ask what Satchit Ananda is, that's a Vedic way of saying that when you become con realize your you being conscious of existence is an evolutionary opportunity and miracle, and so it's it's bliss. You realize the bliss of the opportunity to manifest. And then your free will activates. Then you feel you deserve more than you have believed yourself to be. Kind of like how Lao Tzu says, you got to let go of who you are now to kind of be who you're meant to. Something like that. Anyways, guys, thanks for tuning in. Much blessings and I'll stay.